If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as it loved its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teachings, they will obey yours. But they will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates the Father as well. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. I ask you that you just translate it to our hearts and transform our lives. Lord, I pray that the words I speak and the meditation of my, mouth, of my heart and the words of my mouth will be pleasing in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Thank you. Good job, Marine. Always faithful. You know, we watched the reenactment of the photo this morning, and, and as we saw that, I know tears well up in your heart and your eyes, and you think of sacrifice over the years of many, many people that have given their lives in, in the really... If you, if you really break it all down, they've given their lives and fighting for what I believe and when you talk about truth and, and having justice and things. But as I got to looking, I got thinking about today on July 4th, we celebrate the birth of this country. We celebrate the things that really we can take for granted so easily. I got to looking back on some of the, just real quick, over in the Pacific Islands, there was over 100,000 of our service folks that died in the Pacific War in that island, just that part alone. And I got to looking at the World War II, and I know we talk about being the greatest generation. We talk about the things that happened in that generation and things that were going on. They said that in one account, now there's no way to really put a figure, perfect figure on everything, but there were 60 to 85 million people that were killed in that war, whether it be war casualties or just um, people that were killed in, as a byproduct of what was happening in the war and also the Jews that were killed. And they, the percentage, they say, at the time of population, there was 2.5% of the population of the world that died during World War II. That's a lot of lives. It's a lot of folks. How do you get to that point? As it's amazing to me. I know we have other veterans that are sitting in here today that have fought in different wars, and we appreciate their service. But I, I look at where we are as a nation, where we are as a country, one of the great things that we have going for us still is that we do have, I believe, the seed of godliness that's still within our nation. There is a sense of rightness, a sense of righteousness, or else you do not don a uniform and go thousands upon thousands of miles to free somebody you don't even know about or sometimes you didn't even know you should care about. And you find that you, in this nation, we have been a nation that has been established upon the truth, and it was actually the truth of the gospel. And no matter what the redefinition of history is today and how people can rewrite history, it was still founded on the biblical principles that you'll find in Scripture. You'll see in the Scriptures, and I, and I, I picked this, and I picked this, this sermon title about the world hating, is because we're looking, and, and how can you get to the point where you have 60 to 85 million, there's somewhere in the estimate in there, of 85 million people that are extinguished from this earth over a short amount of time. How do you get to that place? It's not humanly possible. And I do that as a caveat. When we forget that the battle is in the heavenlies, when we forget there are things that are going on, right now we watch this going on, you can watch the news of what's taking place even through the Iraq, what's happening even in Baghdad, and what you're seeing of this new faction and, and the new fascism that's coming up that you see in the Islam, and you watch what's taking place across Baghdad, and you see that they're going in, and there's a whole new destruction. That is humanly impossible to do what they do, is just go in and just extinguish people just to extinguish people. But it's every bit human impossible. It's humanly possible, but impossible for man to come up with that. You start looking at what Hitler did with all the Jewish people and put them in. How did you get a nation to agree to take people off on trains like cattle cars and you put them in a camp and then you extinguish them for the best of your nation? How can you do that? How in the world can anybody get to that point? 
humanly impossible. But what I have found is that I look at this and I see it and what I see the gospel and I see what Jesus was preaching here. He said, if the world hates you, understand the hatred of the world has never subsided. It has never let up. It has always been there because it is fueled with the behind the scenes of the demonic principalities and powers. Do you realize if we take, the, and a lot of religions have done that, you take the demonic out and you say there's no such thing as the devil, there's no such thing as the adversary, it's all just because we are not bettering ourselves. But what I have found is that Jesus came into this world. He said the world's going to hate you. What the principles of the world, the fallen nature of this world, it's going to hate you. It's going to be something that's going to be an enmity against you because it is against God. When the world fell back in the Garden of Eden, when we found Adam and Eve and they released the power of this, what God had given them, authority God had given them to rule this, even this world, you'll find that everything started cascading down from there. And so when Jesus entered this world, when I see the passage of Scripture, for God so loved the world, I put that in the context, and you can just put it in something that we know within our lifetime of the wars and rumors of war you've seen. Just take the World War II of 60 to 85 million people extinguished from this earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his son to the mess that we are. Wow, how could you? Can you imagine as the Heavenly Father looked down over the eons at times and said, here's where I've created this, this blessed environment, but then I watch what man can do with it with the inspiration, because it's humanly impossible for us to do it our own. With the inspiration of the principalities and powers of the heavenly dark places, you're finding that you're watching darkness as it erodes and it's coming in more and more, and we're seeing more and more of the things that's going on around us. We went to the caverns up in the Shenandoah Valley, and and they take you down in an elevator to get down in there. And when Mindy and I were coming back one time from up and seeing Michael in Pennsylvania, and beautiful area up in there. But when you get down in those caverns and they take you down in that elevator and, that, and you're down in the midst of that, I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's about as close as you can get to outer darkness that you can get. Because they got us down there and they turned all the lights off. And then they started talking to you. And they talked for a good bit. And they do it in all these caverns every time you go to one. They talk to you. And you get you totally unaware. And then all of a sudden, they strike a match. And you go like this. Because it is so bright, that one match. What I have found, folks, for God so loved the world that in the midst of the worst darkness you can imagine, he sent his son into this world to save this world. What a powerful message. In a world that right now that we're redefining what truth is. We're redefining instead of saying let truth transform us. We're saying may we transform what truth really is. And Jesus when he's talking in this passage he tells, said, he's telling his disciples look if you belong to this world they would like you. Now here's the problem that I'm having even in this world that we're living in today. Is that we're watching more and more of the churches that we see around us. They're embracing the world because the world likes them. And I would tell you this if the world likes Likes you, you have a problem. I was watching as the Presbyterian Church USA is embracing a lot of things right now that I wonder where are they leaving the truth? It is so the world will embrace them. I have a real issue with churches even today that say it's okay to do this or okay to do that, and it goes contrary to Scripture because they're saying that love trumps all these things. I want to tell you something. For God so loved the world, he gave his son as a sacrifice, and as Jesus is speaking in this passage, he was being hated by the world. It wasn't that the world was embracing him. He was going against the grain of the world. He was bringing truth to this lie of a world that we're living in right now i would dare to say a good litmus test if, if you're in line with oprah you better go back to the bible Amen. if you're in line with even the hollywood stars and you're saying hey i'm lining up with these stars well i gonna tell you something you need to read somebody else's horoscope those are the wrong stars to line up with what I have found is that I look at the passage of Scripture and, and I see what Jesus is te teaching his disciples. He does tell them that he is the vine and the branches, the first part of John 15. He does tell them that you got to love one another. But he's, this, this love that we see that's going on today and the way they're redefining truth, they're also redefining what love is. And love means that we got to tolerate everything and anything that goes on. Folks, I want to tell you something. The dark is getting darker. There is no tolerance. Truth does not tolerate error. It really doesn't. It stands in opposition to that. And when you, anytime you stand in opposition to error, and there's a lot of error that's being preached a lot of times in our churches that say, hey, it's okay to do this. Hey, it's okay to do that. It's just the times in which we live in. 
Well, folks, I'll tell you something. Our, our congregation here, I believe, and this is why we at camp this past week, I want these young people to know what truth is, that they will never walk away from that. They'll never get to a point that say, well, I'm old enough so sin can be redefined. No. And I've had older people to do that to me. I, they redefine sin for me. And they say, hey, this is not sin anymore. I, it used to be when I was a kid. You know, it's okay to tell a few white lies. That's no big deal. It's okay to do this. Man, we would get your mouth washed out as a kid with soap, walk around all day. Uh, ivory, uh, it floats. <laughs> Nothing worse. It hasn't changed. My mama used to, man, she'd put it on me. It didn't matter. Didn't matter. If you did wrong, you did wrong. It was just wrong. No matter, and it has not changed with the times. I was threatening some of them with soap this week. I forgot what it was about. So we can put soap on your mouth and just let you walk around like that. I have found that as I look at scriptures that Jesus, when he says, I am the way, the truth, the truth. Now the world is trying to transform the truth instead of letting the truth transform it. Because what happens is when the truth comes in, and this is why Jesus, when he tells in the scripture right here, he tells them this, he says, look, if I had not come into this world, nobody would really sense the guilt that they're sensing right now. But since I am here, I am truth, the guilt is one thing that you're going to watch that is kicking up all around the world. The guilt of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, Jesus didn't come to condemn anybody. No, but when truth came and the perfection came, when God sent his son, it split time. And he said, okay, you got to do something with this truth. You got to do something with it. Now, what we're doing in churches today and what I have found is that we're, we're cuddling up to the world and we're saying there's a friendship that we can have. Can't we just go along to get along? This is what he tell, James tells us. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? God doesn't make any bones about that. If we cuddle up to the world, if, if Oprah claps for us because we're tolerant of sin, we have a problem. And I don't care how much money Oprah has. If, those, if just use anybody of any great standing, of any great wealth that we see in society, if they're applauding the church saying, finally, you've come along. Well, I would say we've lost something here because Jesus said, I didn't come into this world just to get along with this world. It's not just that I'm coming in here and saying, hey, can't we all just be better people? No, he was coming in and said, if you really want to see transformation in your life, you receive truth. And what truth brings into your life is that spear and that sword that just it separates those things in us that do not belong. And what I have found that in my life and in your life is that when truth comes in, it is like lighting that light, like little light in the midst of all the darkness that goes on in us. And if you ever extinguish that light, it goes back to darkness. And if you've ever been in that place of true darkness, and all of us were before we came to Jesus, we understand that we cannot go back to that. Let me finish out what it says here in James. It says, anyone, James 4 and 4, it says, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. I never want to get to that place. I look at our pre PC USA, and I, you can probably use that as politically correct, Presbyterian USA. And you'll find that they're getting into a place where they're walking in a place and they're saying, and I even saw it posted where one lady said, I believe it was the Holy Spirit that caused us to do these things. And I'm like, what? Don't accredit things that are against the truth of God as the Holy Spirit. Jesus goes on to tell us here in John, the 15th chapter, do not be surprised because I'm telling you folks, the time is coming if you think 60 to 85 million people and 2.5 percent of the population was bad, it's going to even get worse. You look what's heating up right now in the Middle East. There's a cauldron that's heating up, and it is going to spill over. And the Bible promises us that. It says it. the day is coming. But it says those who know their God will stand strong in that day, and they'll do great exploits. They'll do mighty things, but we've got to know that that truth, that Jesus Christ says he is the truth, and to stand in his truth of his word, that sin has not changed, that we all need redemption from our sin. We all need redemption in this world, and it's going to take us standing firm, and with standing firm, I believe persecution will come. There's going to become greater pressure. I leaned over to our stated clerk, Mike, what's his name? Sharp. That was Sharp. Thank y'all. I leaned over Mike Sharp when we were talking about some of our debating on our floor. and I, uh, our, our, Fortunately, we came out strong saying that you know, we do need to reevaluate any kind of relationship we have with the PC Presbyterian Church USA. 
And we came out strong on that. But I, I leaned over him and I said, the homosexual issue will be in our church in the next few years. We'll have to debate it. Why we have to debate it, I don't know. But we're going to have to because we got liberals that would say, you got to love people. I want to tell you something. The only way you love anyone is to speak truth in love. You never want to love somebody by saying, hey, let's be tolerant. You're not loving me. Listen, to the alcoholic, I will not give you a drink. If you want to call me not loving you, that's fine. I will love you in truth. To the cocaine addict, I will not give you a drink. I will not give you cocaine and buy the cocaine for you so that I can say I loved you. And to any one of us that are sinners, we're all sinners that's been reformed by the, and being transformed by the truth of the gospel. And if we don't accept that and say every one of us were bound for hell until Jesus and his truth interjected in our life, and therefore we're transformed. There is nothing that God is going to tolerate in heaven that we think that our love can tolerate and show. There's sometimes I get amazed at how we look at it and we say, we have greater love than God because we tolerate. That's a shame such a shame there's no way we'll have greater love than god because god said this he said i'm going to send my son into this world to redeem those who will receive this redemption but if you do not it is your choice to not do so god stacks the odds against us choosing it he tells them this in john 15 he says he said if they persecuted me they will persecute you also and the reason i even speak this today is because i believe the day is coming and I, mean, I sensed it as I was sitting there, and I don't know if I was sensing a real prophetic thing, but when I leaned over to Mike Shark and I told him, I said, Mike, it's coming to us soon, the debate. Folks, I want to tell you, you better gird your loins because truth is what we've got to have our loins girded with. We've got to know what is truth because you're going to be assaulted. Our young people already, they get assaulted in schools on a lot of things. We can tell them to just say no to drugs because we see the damage of that and everything. But then when they get into college, oh, it's their choice to have drunkenness and all this kind of stuff. It becomes their choice when they get of age. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. It's never a good choice when we do things that are contrary to Scripture. Right. You know, God will let you have that choice. And so I look at this and I see this word called persecution. It's called that for a reason. It is a scary, joy-filled term. Wow. It's kind of strange. Because Jesus says, you're going to be persecuted. If you align yourself with me and the truth that I have in me, I am truth. And if you align yourself with that truth, you are going to be persecuted. That's just part of it. You know, there are times that you're going to feel, I don't know if I really want to go here or not. But then God is saying, no, truth is the true dividing line in this world. It's the place where all of the heavenlies and the demonic principalities and powers, because it says Satan is the father of all lies. And so what he is doing is he is permeating this world with his lies in order to set up this great time of great falling away and persecution that will come. That day is coming, folks. And I wish I could tell you, I wish it was about a generation or two off. I want to strengthen this generation because I think they'll see persecution in America like we've never seen. It's coming, folks. And I want to strengthen them with truth, even to the point if they'll say, if it costs me my life. You see the fellows that are raising the flag here today in symbolic. It said it did not matter. They said, we're going to conquer this island, even if it costs me my life. We're going to do it. And there were so many it cost their life for them to do that. And that simple flag reason that tears bring to my eyes, I know there were guys who lost their life. The, the, the islands were littered with bodies of people believing in something so strong, they're willing to walk into a hell of bullets and today as a church i wonder if we have that same strength in us and we say truth is going to be truth no matter what hollywood redefines it as can we stand firm in that and i look at our young people and i ask them will you stand when that day comes will you stand knowing there's truth not just sitting there going well i don't know that's the way mom and daddy believe you got to know what you believe truth itself will bring judgment it always does that's what jesus christ says right here he said i came in this world and it is he brought judgment because of the truth that he lived christ the innocent brought the guilty verdict to a guilty world. And the world doesn't like it, and now they're redefining what guilty is and what we should be guilty of. And I want to tell you something. Compromise in our life will never, ever build a strong believer. Society will celebrate compromise and persecute the truth as, as something that's totally intolerant of what this world is. And that's the new buzz world. you got to be tolerant. And that tolerant means love in the world and what the world's all about. But here's what I know and is what I can see in Scripture, that 
God, the world's not going to love you, and God's love in us should be transforming us, and it had better line up here. Because then when that lady said, hey, the Holy Spirit has led us to violate the Word of God, folks, I'm going to tell you something. That is not the Holy Spirit. That doesn't work that way. You say, it's kind of hard and harsh. Folks, this is escalating. I appreciate these guys coming today and seeing this. We have not lived within those times. Most of us younger ones have not lived. We've lived through the Vietnam War, Korean War, Afghanistan, and Iraq. We've not lived through a world war like what they saw in World War II, where you have Japan wanting the conquest, you have Germany that's wanting to take over, and they're extinguishing people on both sides of the world there. We haven't seen that, but what we're seeing right now is the rays of fascism and stuff in the Islam and you're watching things, they can kill you just because you don't believe. I love what Netanyahu said this past week because the Presbyterian divested, the Presbyterian church divested themselves in Israel. Anything has to do with Israel, they didn't want to invest anything in it. And he told them this, he said, that's fine. He said, but come look at our democracy here and then get on a bus and go look at the other countries around. And he said, but before you do that, make sure that bus is armored and don't tell them you're Christians. And then you see where you want to stand. And he was right. He was right. Because, folks, there is a breaking loose around. We're not praying for our Christian brothers and sisters. You know, most of us, when we were growing up, we looked at the Iron Curtain as a place to go to share the gospel. We got kids going to Hong Kong. They're going to be sharing the gospel, and it is a, a place that you have uh, communism all over China and stuff. And But you're going to find, and as I look at this, and I say they're going to a pretty safe place in the sense of Hong Kong. But I look at this, and I wonder what is it going to take for us to awaken with this gospel message that we have. Yes, it's going to make the world feel guilty because we're going to preach truth that Jesus Christ is the only way. There is no other way to heaven except for through Jesus Christ. Muhammad didn't get it. Buddha didn't get it. Confucius didn't get it. You can find any one of the, the Dalai Lama. He don't have it. None of these folks have it. What we have is the treasure of all heaven that when it was the darkest moment in time, he split open the heaven and earth and he says, now my son is coming. And as Jesus came as that babe in the manger, died on the cross, rose from the grave. Here's the truth that we have to present to this world. And yes, it will cost us something. Amen. If it's not going to cost us something, that's why he says you're going to take up your cross. You're going to die daily. That's not optional, folks. There are people out there that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I keep it the best-kept secret of my life. Truth will never change. Our perception of it sometimes can change because society puts so much pressure on us, but it's all about obedience to the Word. And I'm not talking about that Westboro Baptist bunch, not that bunch. Honestly, you can take extremes out there, but I'll tell you something. If, if you want to try to compare some of the extremes out there, even our extremes are not near as bad as what you'll find in Islam that produces so many extremes around the world. So much. I don't think they've still found the or little girls that they've been kidnapped. I don't think they've found them yet. And they will sell them off because they have every right to in their religion. If you're an imbecile, if you're, a, what do they call them? Yeah. Infidel. They can do whatever they want to. They're the imbeciles. What I have seen in scriptures and what I see right here in this passage of scriptures, Jesus is telling us this. He's saying, look, they will treat you the same way they treated me. Stand firm. Stand firm. No truth. Truth will always give you courage to stand in that day. Truth will always be in that place where when we're standing in that truth, that it will be the dividing line. It said in Matthew 5, it said, they will persecute you falsely. Say all kinds of things about you. 1 Corinthians 4, 12, it said, when you're persecuted, we've got to endure that. In 2 Timothy 3, 12, it said, life in Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted. If you live your life in Jesus Christ, persecution will come. That's why Jesus, when he's telling us this, said they hated me first, they're going to hate you too. If you stand with who I am with who I, and what I spoke, he said they're going to feel the guilt of their own sin. And because they feel the guilt of their own sin, they're going to make all kinds of excuses for that. And they'll call it toleration. They'll call it love. They'll call it everything. But I want to tell you, the father of all lies is web, weaving his web of deception in this day and time that the church has got to stand firm. And we say, no, Jesus Christ is the only way. And sin will still be sin as the sun sets today. It's still going to be the same as it was in scriptures. 
And what I see in scriptures is that God wants to take, and, I, and I'll finish out this passage of scripture right here. It says this, and this is what I like, because I've been talking about going from the mundane to miraculous. God wants to use us in a powerful way. He wants us to be that, those people that walk in the miraculous. He wants people that walk in the truth. To walk in the truth, you ought to be walking in the miraculous. You ought to be walking in that place where you believe God can do the awesome and the miraculous things of seeing people's lives transformed. He says this in verse 24, that same passage of John 15. He said, if I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen the miracles, and yet they've hated both me and my father. Wow. They ought to be applauding. They did not. The world ought to be plotted when you see that people that are getting off drugs and alcohol, they're getting off of their life of whatever it may be. They, may, they ought to be applauded when you've seen the teen challenged work that's been done, even all, and they've got a great success record of seeing people come off addictions and stuff because of Jesus Christ. Not everybody, it's about 75 or 80 percent, something like that. If they'll stick with the program, they can come off of that. Even what we see in the, the, um, in, in the counseling and alcohol counseling, AA and stuff, that was based in Christianity, and the world took it over and said, oh, we can do just as good, but you can have whatever God you want. No, it was based in a Christian standard, and when it was based in a Christian standard, they had great success. The world tries to mimic everything we do. They try to mimic love. The only true love is when we're standing in truth, and we speak the truth in love. I don't have to smile when I'm telling somebody, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you'll be eternally separated. I don't have to smile about that. But I can tell them, even with some tears in my heart, Jehovah's Witness knocking on my door yesterday. I told her that y'all are a cult. And I uh, said, y'all have already filled up the 144,000. I don't need to go. No, we haven't. And I was like, yeah, you have. There's plenty of y'all. I said, I don't need y'all. And I said, but you do need. There's got to be a change. And I said, this is where truth is. I said, y'all aren't walking in truth. You're not walking in truth. So when Jehovah's Witness walks on your door, you don't have to debate with them theologically or anything else. Just tell them they're not walking in truth. That their Watchtower Bible is off, and they're wrong. And you say, you don't even have to smile if you don't want to, but I do. I kind of laugh and cut up with them. There's a pile of them going through the neighborhood. Hey, there's a bunch more of y'all, you know. Just have fun with them. But I want them to know that when Mormons come through my neighborhood, I tell them too. You got 18-year-old elders or 16-year-old elders pedaling on a bicycle. I'm like, you're not old enough to be an elder, number one. Number two, I said, y'all got so many in inaccuracies in your scriptures that y'all use that you're missing the boat also. That's where truth has got to meet, right there. We're so afraid to speak truth. I mean, just tell them, that, if nothing else, just tell them you're not walking in truth. When I pinned those guys one time coming back from Guatemala in the bathroom, they, they were in the bathroom, and I saw elder so-and-so. I said, you realize y'all guys are in error? They are like, what? <laughs> you realize you're just, you're just wrong. We got to walk in this truth that believes that Jesus Christ is the truth. And what we see in Scripture, if you add anything, take anything away, you're missing it. What we see in Scripture and what we see, what God wants to do in this day and time, there is a heavenly battle that is going on. And the first place, that here's the way the enemy works. First place he wants to go, he wants to intimidate you out of your belief. And if he can ever get you intimidated, cowardly, not believing, and if he can ever get our kids saying, oh, well, I don't really want to say anything because I don't want to create a stir. Thank you, ladies, for creating a stir. We've got too many of the folks, and this is what, perturbs me about our denomination. You got a lot of people that believe just like this, but they don't want to create a stir. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. The devil will come rattle your door. If you don't want to create a stir, he'll come to your doorstep. Yeah, there's no truce. I'm glad the guys didn't take a truce there in, with the Japanese at the time. There was no truce. It was to defeat the enemy. The only reason you go to war is to defeat the enemy. You don't go just to have a peaceful truce. There is a war that's on. It's for the generation that's to come. I'm telling the older ones in here, we better stand in truth. Give them something to follow. Young people, there's coming a day when you're going to have to stand for that same truth. And you know what? If you stand for Jesus, it will bring conviction to this world. And there will come persecution. But it's a scary, joy-filled turn. Because the Bible says, blessed are you when you're persecuted. Blessed are you. Man, none of us going to walk out this door going looking for persecution, are we? But when you stand in truth, it will come looking for you. Stand in the truth.
And the truth is, this world has been judged guilty by the cross of Calvary. And it's being judged by a resurrected Savior one day, someday. But all they've got to do to escape that judgment is to receive Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Wow, that sounds so simple. But we have a church that's walking around as a mute, and we won't tell anybody. I don't want anyone, and I think I'm in good company because God wishes for no one to perish. I would hate to any one of our loved ones, friends, or anyone else not to know Jesus Christ. But folks, just as I got teary-eyed when they're raising this banner right here with the flag, I got a little teary-eyed because I'm thinking of the sacrifice that was made. I think about all those that have gone on before us in Hebrews 11th chapter that's cheering us on now. I don't want to embarrass them by shrinking back, by not proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, by not standing in truth in this day when it's going to get tougher. I want to stand for that truth no matter what it costs us. So yeah, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and persecution. Let's stand together. Father, I ask you that you will help us in this day. There's a lot that we do that brings glory to your name. There's a lot that we do that we step back and we say, I don't really want to get involved. I'm grateful that when you ask your son to be born in a manger for this dark, dank, horrible world, he came. Gosh, I'm thankful for that. Mm -mm -mm. You've loved us when we're so unlovely. And now if we as a church buy into what the world calls love, it's just toleration of sin in which you cannot tolerate. You're a holy God. You sent your son as the righteous offering so that we can be washed of our sins. Oh, Father, please help us as a church to stand in your truth. Lord, at this time, this world is, is reeling and rocking. Give us your strength. Let us stand boldly in your word, in your truth. Let us stand as if Jesus was speaking through us each day. God, break us to make us new. Here's a call I want to ask you today. If uh, As I preach this, some of you, some of your hearts kind of fluttered a little bit. Now, we're going to sing Amazing Grace. Here's the prayer call today. God, give me a deposit of boldness to stand in this day. Maybe you felt yourself at work shrink back a little bit from your message that you're supposed to proclaim. I'm not talking about getting yourself fired. I'm talking about looking for those openings. Not to be obnoxious for obnoxious sake, but look for those openings to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe you say, hey, Lord, I want to be bolder than what I am right now. I'm going to ask you to come stand with me today because I'm asking for that same kind of boldness in this day, in this time in which we live. Even if it costs us a little persecution, Lord, you came into this world and sent Jesus Christ in this world that we may stand in your truth. If you have a prayer need this morning of that magnitude, saying, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need to stand bolder. If you do not know Jesus Christ, the first place you need to start is knowing him. Know him. There's no other way around it. You've got to bow your knee to Jesus Christ. We'll sing Amazing Grace. If you need a prayer for courage, boldness, or if you've never received Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to invite you to come. There is an anointing that God wants to do on you today. Let's sing together.
Yeah, I want to ask the youth to come down. I need to pray for you guys. I know we just got out of camp. Yeah, I'm going to ask all the youth, if you would, just come. We're going to pray for you as a church. Y'all, come on. Just stand right here. Face me. It's fine. You can face me. 